morning's scripture reading is from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 1. So that'll be on page 624 if you are using a pew Bible. Page 624 in the pew Bible, Psalm 119, verses 1 through 16. This is the word of the Lord. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Let me pray for us as we begin our time together in God's word. Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. You have spoken in your word. Would you enable us by your grace to have ears to hear? Would you enable me to explain it clearly, God? God, I feel like a a kid standing before a mountain made of stone full of diamonds with my own weak shovel. Yet, God, you have given us your spirit. Help us to believe that you are the one who will speak to us through your word, that you gladly give us diamonds out of your word as we do the work of studying, of hearing, of listening, and of desiring to obey you, God. These are all gifts from you. We thank you for it. We pray as we go to your word. Would you give us truth and give us hearts to hear? In Jesus' name, amen. We turn to Psalm 119, Psalm 119. I'll be reading in the ESV translation, um, the Pew Bible, it's page 624. That'll be the, a different, slightly different translation. I wonder what comes to mind when you think of duty. When I say the word duty, what comes to mind? Some of you who are a little more well-traveled might be thinking of taxes and all sorts of things when you come and go and all that stuff. But for, for average Joe, like me and most of you in here probably, right, um, we think of things like chores, think of things like scrubbing floors, um, all sorts of things like that. My guess is probably not happiness. Happiness is probably not something that you relate if you're doing a word relationship between those two words, right? Uh, at least it's not for me. I think in the English language, that's partially because that's the connotation of the word duty. It, its connotation is one of the opposite of happiness, right? If you had to pick an antonym or something, you know, contrasting word, you would, you would say, oh yes, duty, the contrasting word would be happiness. Um, but that's not completely true, and you and I kind of intuitively in some ways know this, right? So, for example, um, if you really enjoy playing soccer, and, um, which that's just a lot of running, so I don't personally enjoy it, but I know a lot of you, you could really enjoy soccer, right? Um, and so you enjoy that. Um, if you're on a team, you have a duty to play as hard as you can while you're out there, right? For the sake of your teammates, for the sake of just enjoying the game, um, you, you have this duty, and yet if you really truly enjoy soccer, overall there is delight and happiness as you're doing that. Um, for those of us who are a little less um, kinesthetic in the way we think, we don't like to exercise, um, things like that, perhaps you might think of uh, you have a duty to know your best friend, to talk to them, right? You have a best friend, and, you, and in some respect, you, if they're your best friend, there is a duty you have, a responsibility to hear them when they talk and to listen. So today what I want to look at is a duty that we have, which is a happy duty. Um, And and this is not me just imposing my idea that this is something you have to be happy about. This is something that the scripture tells us is a happy duty. And so we see that in Psalm 119. So before we even jump into this, I just want to make it clear where I'm getting this 
kind of main point from in the psalm, because I don't want you to miss this. I'm getting it from verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 119, where it begins with blessed two times in a row. That's, that is a way, we don't talk in those terms very often, um, but what it means is happiness, true, lasting delight. Not just surface level happiness, but true, lasting happiness. Jesus says, you know, blessed are those, he talks about the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled with God's righteousness, right? Um, so it's, it's this idea. So there's a true happiness. And in verse four, first of all, intuitively we should know, so blessed are those who, what, keep God's word. That's the basic premise of the psalm. Um, we should already know that because if God has spoken, that's a command. But verse four makes it explicit when it talks about you have commanded, God, you have commanded that your word would be kept. So we have a duty God has commanded us, therefore we must obey what God has said, and we have delight. It is a blessing. How blessed are those who will keep God's word, keep his commandments. Let me do a brief intro to Psalm 119 as a whole real quick. It is the longest psalm you will find. It is 176 verses. In fact, it's longer than several, uh, maybe even many books in your Bible. It is a very long section of scripture. It has one grand theme, which if you haven't guessed it already, is the word of God. That's the theme. There are over eight synonyms, at least eight synonyms that appear in this text um, for the word of God. So it's so it's not so even though it's 176 verses, it's all about this psalm. It's not like it's just boring, monotonous talking about God's word. He he is uh, he is a poet describing it, right? Just like you know, poets use all sorts of words to describe their love for something or someone. That's what, you have the psalmist pulling on every word he can think of because he delights in God's word. So law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, ordinances, commandments, rules, words, over and over again. And the psalm is also interesting. There are other psalms that work this way, but this is one of them, and this is by far um, the most massive in this respect, but that are, it's an acrostic psalm. So what that means is you have each line starts with a particular letter, and then the rest of the line flows out of that letter. So, um, so and you can see that each section is divided into eight verses, Okay. And you, ha- you know this, uh, well, you don't, may not know this, now you know this, um, because of these transliteration of Hebrew letters. You might not have known that's what that was, but probably most of you in your translation, you have like Aleph, right? Right above verse 1. If you keep going on, you get to Beth, uh, Gimel, Dalit, so on. Um, so these are, this is the transliteration of the Hebrew letters of the alphabet. So it's an acrostic going through the Hebrew alphabet. So basically what he's saying is A to Z, I will wax eloquently about your word, God, because I love your word. I'm going to say A to Z about it, okay? So if you're looking at this in English, you could picture the first eight verses would all begin with the letter A. The second set of eight verses would all appear with the letter B. That's how the lines would all begin, okay? So there is artistry going on in this psalm. And you may wonder, I mean, you have this gigantic psalm all about the word of God. Why so long? Why so many verses on this? Um, I think the basic answer is he can't help himself, right? I mean, he can't. We, we, it's like asking a poet, why did you write such a long poem about, you know, such and such? Because it was beautiful and it was worthy about writing and I couldn't help it. It just, the words started coming and I couldn't help it. Um, and so I think that's what we have happening here. He delights in God's word. And ultimately, this, this is important, ultimately, because this is not worship of the Bible. You need, we need to get this clear. He loves the word of God because he loves the God of the word. Don't miss that. He loves the God of the word. Therefore, he loves the word of God, right? So if, if I love someone, I want to hear from them, right? And so I delight in their words, but really I'm delighting in them when I hear their words. And so I can wax and wane about loving, the, uh, loving their word. And what I'm really saying is I love the person who's given me this word. Your words are precious to me. And so that's what we have happening in this psalm. Today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16. Uh, The outline I'm going to follow is, uh, this is kind of the division I'm going to go with. Verses 1 through 4, we're going to see keeping God's word is a happy duty. So in verses 1 through 4, we see that keeping God's word is a happy duty. Verses 5 through 8 flows from that where you have the psalmist and hopefully our hearts agreeing with him by saying, therefore, I commit to keep your word. Therefore, I commit to keep your word. 
verses 5 through 8. And then in verses 9 through 16, we have how we pursue this happy duty. We have this commitment. How do I pursue that commitment? What does it look like to really keep your word? Um, How am I going to put that into practice? So let's look at verses 1 through 4. Keeping God's word is a happy duty. I'll read verses 1 through 3 first just to get us started, and then we'll move on to verse 4. But blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. So again, blessed appears twice at the beginning of this. Happiness, that's what he starts out with, happiness. Happy is the one. Uh, You might even say the good life. He's basically saying this is what the good life looks like. The good life is those whose way is blameless who walk in the law of the Lord. So way and walk get used there. Um, we, We use this too. We talk about like, you know, hey, the path you're on is not a good one. Or the path you're on, this is a good path you're on in life. What we mean is the way of your life, the way you're going in life, what you're doing in life, what, you know, how you're living life, just everything about your life. So way and walk. So it's, it's those who are blameless. The track of their life is one of blamelessness, which is the idea of integrity. We've seen this in Job, if you've been in the Job Sunday School class. Blameless does not mean um, that it doesn't have to mean you are without sin. Although there is some truth to that right? I mean, the truly happy life would be the one that's sinless because sin clouds our view of God. And so Jesus, though he was a man of sorrows and suffered greatly, absolutely was blameless in the fullest sense of that word, completely did not deserve to suffer. And so, and yes, there was sorrow, but there was also joy, right? And because of him, we can have joy because we're not blameless in the fullest sense, But what he's saying here is he's saying those who have a a, a way of life that is full of integrity. It's not double-mindedness. It's not hypocritical. It's not put on a mask. I live this way here and I live this way there. It is an undivided heart when it comes to living according to God's instructions. That's what he means by blameless here. Living by God's instructions. Not only do I know God's instructions, but I live by it. And and that's specifically what he says because he talks about they walk in in the way of the law of the Lord. You see that, right? Walk in the law of the Lord, or the word is Torah there. And we, it gets translated over as law. Um, it's probably a little confusing to us as English speakers, though, because when I hear law, I don't know about you, but when I hear law, I think of like um, a book of statutes or something, right? And there are statutes in here, and I think that's included in the idea of Torah, but really the idea is God's instructions. It's more than just a bunch of laws. It's his instructions on how to live life. And it's the law of the Lord. This is God's word, the Lord, the one who rules over all things. It is his word. So what he's saying then is the good life is living according to God's word. That's that's kind of the point there. The good life, the truly happy life, is the one that is lived on a path in accordance with God's instructions, the way God has said to live. And so I wonder wonder if, if you believe that. If you're like me, there are, there are days where, yes, by God's grace, I really believe that, and there are days where subtly we, we kind of bring in a little bit of unbelief or a little bit of doubt, right? And so the question is, where are there pockets of unbelief? Where I hear this and other things actually seem a lot better at producing ultimate happiness to me. You might fill in the blank and come to your answer if I said true happiness, true happiness, living the good life is blank. What comes to mind in that blank? I'm not saying there aren't other things that we enjoy that are God's gifts. We can enjoy God's gifts. But I'm talking about, what is it, man? This is the good life. If only I had this, then I'd be happy. Well, if it's walking in God's ways, we're, on, we're in the right spot, right? But if we're honest with ourselves, there are times where we don't believe that. And so where are the pockets of unbelief? What is it I'm trying to put in that place for true, lasting happiness? Well, verse 2 starts out similarly. Blessed are those who keep his testimony. So keep is kind of a similar idea to walk, but it's, it's I'm clinging to it. I'm, I want to do it. I want to hold on to it. And it's his testimonies, what God has told us about himself and his ways. I want to live in line with God's ways. And verse 3 is saying, uh, kind of restating that in a slightly different way. He gives the negative side. These are the, these, blessed are those who do no wrong. They don't, they don't wander from your ways, God, but they walk in your ways. He's kind of restating it there in verse 3. 
So this psalm and the blessing that he's talking about is not an academic knowledge of God's word. His point isn't, if you just, if you just know a bunch of facts about the Bible, right? you can, you can just tell me all sorts of facts about it. Ah, that's the blessed way. I don't think that's his point because there's, there's this keeping, walking, right? Your ways. The whole psalm is very much doing God's word. It's not just knowing God's word. And so I, I think the danger for us, because we, and so this is, don't, when I say danger, don't, don't take that the wrong way. Being in a Bible church is an amazing blessing because we hear God's word. I mean, I think about it in my own life. Um, I mean, I was, when I was here in high school, I sat under Rod's preaching and grew tremendously. I sat under Bible studies from people who took me to God's word and explained it. I benefited tremendously. So this is a um, irreplaceable blessing when you are in part of a place where you hear God's word regularly. But there is a danger and I think the danger is we can become very much knowing what God's word says, but not nearly doing what we're knowing. You get what I'm saying? We, we can know a lot, but not do it. And, um, and the New Testament makes it very clear. The blessing is in the doing of God's word. It's not just hearers only, right? It's those who do God's word. And, and by doing, I really mean at its base level, believing what God has said. And then when I believe what God has said, that affects the way I live my life. Um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm not talking, when I'm saying this, I'm not talking about um, your salvation is one of grace and then, and then you have to add your own works to it. Don't hear me saying that. It's not, it's not adding works to your salvation any more than bringing flowers to your wife on your anniversary is adding works to your love for your wife. I mean, you have, you have a glad duty to do that. You want to do that. So this is not earning favor. This is the nature of love is that especially love for God is I want to know you, God, and I want to do what you say. That's love. This isn't adding works to it. This is trust. If I trust you, then I'm going to do what you say, God, because you're right. Jesus said in John 14, 21, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Right? So it's keeping God's word is what the psalmist is after. That is the good life. And ultimately, the reason is, and so this, this ties into what I just said, this is not saying um, add a bunch of rituals so that you can somehow earn favor with God. Because the goal in all of this is that I might know God more. You see that in the second half of the verse, okay? So the first half of the verse we're looking at here in verse 2 is, blessed are those who keep his testimonies. What's parallel to that? Who seek him with their whole heart. You see that? What's parallel to, uh, to keeping his testimonies? It's seeking him. I'm seeking you. When I'm seeking to obey your word, God, really what I'm seeking is I'm seeking you. I want to know you and your ways. Often, I think we're, we're not happy because we settle for a lot less as Christians. This isn't our main pursuit in life, seeking God. It gets clouded with other things, right? Um. Now, seeking God does mean you live in the real world. I'm not saying this means you move into some monastery and then, you know, that's how you really seek God. If you read through the psalm, he's living in the real world and he's seeking God. Um, and so that's what we're to do, whether it's at our job, whether it's raising children, whether it's being a good friend to other people, whether it's just relating to fellow believers in the church, um, whether it's shopping at the grocery store. It's, I want to seek you and all these things that I do, God, all the things you've given me to do. So we seek him with our whole heart, everything in us, the inner, the inner man, our will, our desires, our affections, we are seeking him. Verse 10 reiterates that point, with my whole heart I seek you. So that's really a main point of this psalm. You're seeking God. God, I want to know you. So it is a psalm about the Bible, but it's really about seeking God. And the psalmist says, those who seek to live according to God's word are living the good and happy life. Now, let me make a quick note here, because I don't want you to hear me wrong. I don't want you to hear this as saying, um, if I seek your word, and I, I seek to live according to your word, God, then you will give me the good life, which is ease, comfort, a larger bank account, all these other things. Um, Proverbs do tell us that there is a connection in this world between obeying God and the way things tend to work out. But Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes and Jesus' life tell us that those who keep God's word in this world do not always experience unmitigated, in fact, they never experience, unmitigated happiness and joy in the sense that life is easy. 
What they experience is the joy of knowing, God, you are with me no matter what I'm going through, right? And so, so that's what we see happening here. And in fact, we even know that because if you keep reading through this psalm, he talks about affliction several times. So he's not under some illusion. He's not some guy like living in an ivory tower and he's like, yeah, man, you know, blessed, blessed are those who keep God's word. Uh, I think I'm gonna go take a nap and I'll cut back up, study God's word some more, and then I'll eat dinner. Um, he's suffering. He's going through affliction. And so again, his, his happiness, is, for example, in verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction, not that God will make everything easy right away. No, that your promise gives me life. I have life in the middle of the affliction I'm facing. I have you. So the happiness comes in knowing God and his promises, not immediate relief from trouble. Again, you see this in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ who suffered, who was a man of sorrows, and yet his way was completely blameless, and he kept the word of God. And for us, he actually was forsaken that we may never be forsaken, right? On that cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only one who should have never been forsaken so that we will never be forsaken if we belong to God. You can think of those throughout church history. I mean, I I was recently reading about... um, John Bunyan, so not Paul Bunyan, not the big guy with the axe, John Bunyan, right, he was a pastor, um, wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Um, He was in jail for long periods of time. Uh, Before all that, his mom and one of his sisters died when he was young. Um, Just a very tumultuous life in a lot of ways. His first daughter was born blind. Uh, He ends up in prison for preaching the gospel for many years, and he knows he's got, um, well, his first wife dies, and his other wife is taking care of all of her stepchildren now while he's in jail for preaching the gospel. Um, and, and Spurgeon said, if you, John, uh, John Bunyan was one of his favorite guys in many ways because if you pricked him, he bled Bible. Because when he was in jail, he, and, and it's not like John Bunyan was like, you know, past, uh, this kind of unfeeling guy, and he was just like, you know, well, the Lord's will be done to my family. He said that was one of the hardest things about being in jail. He knew his blind daughter needed him. He knew his wife was on her own trying to take care, scrape together enough stuff to take care of the family. So again, my point is this doesn't mean no affliction. Church history confirms that, and Jesus confirms it. But what this means is ultimately we have God with us. His promises are our comfort. And verse 4 now, moving on, verse 4, so it's this delight, this happiness, but verse 4 tells us it's also a duty. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Okay, so God is the ruler of the entire universe. He gives commands. We have a duty to keep them. This isn't a suggestion. It's not like God gives a suggestion, right? Don't murder, just a suggestion. Just try, I mean, I, I think it would work better if you didn't murder. So, you know, what do you think about that? Give it a try. Uh, it's, you shall not murder, right? Um, even coveting, right? Coveting could be one that seems, well, it's not really hurting anyone that I desire more and more stuff and um, I'm just not happy, I'm not content. He says, you know, you shall not covet. So God gives us his commands. And and what's interesting is, again, these commands are what produce the greatest delight for us. God's command ultimately is, seek me. Be happy in me. It's not like his commands are ultimately something that would not produce happiness. They will produce ultimate happiness for the longest duration of time, forever. So that's what God kindly commands us to to turn away from sin, which, which looks pleasing and is pleasing for a season, to having himself, to having salvation right standing before him, everlasting life in his presence where there is fullness of joy. Perhaps at this point, though, I need to say this, perhaps you've seen the Bible as simply a set of rules, kind of like an IRS tax publication, right? You thought of it as just in terms of it's got all these rules in here, um, seems a little irrelevant, a little boring, but this is a book about who God is. God God didn't have to reveal himself. He's a creator, but he has revealed himself to us. He has told us about himself, his ways, his designs in this book. Told us what he's like. We can hear from God in the Bible is what I'm saying. This is not just uh, like tax publication, right? Circular 15 or something just goes around. 
And you can hear ultimately of the greatest story of the entire Bible, the, the storyline of the entire Bible, which is that God, in God's great love, while we were his enemies, because we have gone astray, we have said, I want to live for my own self, that in that condition, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and the whole Old Testament was pointing to this. So this was his plan from the beginning, that his son would come, live the perfect life in obedience to God's law that we did not do, although it would be blessing to us the more we do it, and he died and he rose again that we might have salvation. If we would agree with God and say, you are right, God, you are king, I don't want to keep living for all this other stuff. I want to live for you. So do you want to know God? Perhaps you don't. Perhaps you're thinking, I don't really want to know God. I would just encourage you to at least ask yourself why. Why is it that you don't want to know God? Is it what the Bible says, which I think it is, that we want to live as king of our own lives? I like, I like things the way I am. True happiness is found with me sitting on the throne of my life, God. God. That's what the Bible says. But perhaps you're here and you, and you have a desire to know God. There's some sense of, I want to know you, God. That's a gift from God if you have that desire. And so if, if you have that desire, the way you're going to seek God is you're going to go to his word. And if this is new to you, I suggest you start in one of the gospels, perhaps. So you get to the New Testament, the second half of your Bible, and you start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Pick one of those. Maybe Mark. Mark's the shortest. Or maybe John. Um, we have some copies, a few copies of the New Testament you could take for free out there in the foyer. Um, if you have a Christian friend, maybe you ask them to read through it with you. Um, I don't think they're going to turn you away. But seek after him if he has given you this desire. Well, back to our psalm. God's word tells us we have a happy duty to obey it. Um, and this reality has to be personally grabbed onto if you're going to experience the happiness of it. It's interesting, in the first few verses of the psalm, I don't know if you notice, he's been talking in the third person. He's been saying, blessed are those who, those who would seek after, who, you know, who would seek your word, who would obey you. Now he's going to get very much, um, oh, that my ways may be according to your word. He's going to use my and I. He's, this is personal. He's grabbing onto this personally. What does this mean for him? What does this mean for you? And so we see that longing. He has, he has therefore, so verses five through eight, Therefore, I commit to keep your word. And in verse 5, we see this longing. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. So he has this deep longing. Uh, oh, that my ways. This is his longing of his heart. That my ways would be in keeping your statutes, your word. It's comforting to me that the psalmist, the one who's inspired to write the word of God here, also from his own heart realizes I don't always perfectly keep it. Oh, that I may keep your word, right? I mean, because you might read this and think, well, yeah, of course this guy, I mean, he, he never sinned. No, he sinned. He failed, just like you and me. Everyone has except for Jesus. And yet he said, so he has this longing, oh, that my, I might keep your ways. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. And so for you and I, that's the call for us today too. Would that be the longing of our hearts? May I keep your statutes. In verses 6 and 7, he gives two uh, possible outcomes or results if, he would, if this desire is fulfilled. If, I'm able to, if I keep your statutes, God, here's some good things that I can be encouraged by. You might even say in some way this is a motivation to fulfill this desire, this wish. Verse 6 says, Then I shall not be put to shame, having, fixed my, eyes, uh, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I won't be put to shame. When I look at your word, I won't feel shame. When I see do not lie, I won't feel ashamed because I'm, I'm walking in your ways. I'm, I'm not lying. When I see do not steal, I'll be encouraged in that rather than feeling ashamed. Our sin does bring shame. Even as believers, we feel shame. Now, the greatest news for us is that Jesus ultimately has taken all of our shame. I mean, that's good news. But there is a sense in which when I sin, I grieve the Spirit of God, and I feel a sense of shame, a right sense of shame, right? Not that I've been kicked out of God's family, but just like a child who, wants to, who loves their parents when they're caught in sin, feels some sense of shame. Well, the second outcome 
of learning his righteous standards is in verse 7. I will praise you with an upright heart. Praise, praise is the overflow of delight out of the heart for the object of whatever it is you're praising. The someone or the something that you're praising, you have a delight for that in your heart. It flows out and we call that praise. So, so the, um, you know, you think of it like um, you see some amazing athletic feat that happens, right? And your heart just wells up and you're like, yes, right? You see some beautiful uh, piece of artwork and something inside of you says, wow, that is beautiful. That, that's praise coming out of your lips from a delight in the heart. And so that's what he's saying here. When, when I'm, if my uh, heart is upright, it's lining up with your ways, God, the more I'm going to delight and praise you. Right? The more it's, it's going to flow out of my heart. I'm not going to um, feel this need to run from you. Um, I, I'm going to be delighting in what you say, and that's a reflection of who you are. So I'm, I'm going to praise you more as a result of walking in your ways. My eye has been trained to appreciate you and what you love. Well, verse 8, after considering these outcomes, he commits to fulfill his longing. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. So this is not just a restatement of the commitment. This is our, our, his desire. This is the commitment. He has a desire, and now he's saying, I'm committed to doing it. And this is important because... Um, Desire doesn't necessarily transmit to anything changing, right? I mean, you think of it like how many of you, is, you don't have to raise your hand, but if, you know, as a kid, you like wanted to be a firefighter or a doctor or something, um, you had this desire, but there was no commitment. You didn't pursue it. And that's okay. You don't have to feel bad about it. There's nothing sinful about that. I'm just saying, th- the point is, you can have a desire, and without a commitment, it really doesn't really do any good, ultimately. So there's a commitment here to keep God's word, to pursue God's word. And he can only do it if God goes with him. Do not utterly forsake me. So we have the, the path of the truly happy life is of keeping God's word. And we have this heartfelt longing, oh, that my ways may be steadfast. And we have this commitment, I will keep your statutes. That's where we're at so far. But how? How will I fulfill this longing that I have? The psalmist goes on to ask that. And uh, we need to ask that as well. So how we pursue this happy duty. Verses 9 through 16. He asked the question in verse 9, the beginning of it, how can a young man keep his way pure? Um, Just to be clear, I don't think he's just talking about avoiding sexual immorality. I think that's part of it, but I think purity is just the way of my life. It lines up with you, God, in your ways. It fits with you. Um, He says young man. I don't think the point is only this applies to young people, but I will say this stands in contrast to the way our world tends to think, right? This idea of, you know, you're young. It's all about you. You just do whatever you want. And then one day you can consider, you know, what God says. Um, but, I mean, if the problem is ultimately my heart is already wanting to be king, I mean, how am I going to change that down the road? I mean, this, I, I can't just all of a sudden wake up one day on my own and make that change. So, especially if, if you are a young person and you know Jesus as your Savior, life is not all about you. And you, should, and you know that, even at a young age. So don't, don't fall for the lives of the world that says it is all about you. Instead, seek God. Seek his word. And even if you're old, start today, right, if you haven't been doing this. So how can I keep my way according to your ways, God? Verse 9, second half of it, gives us a basic answer. By guarding it according to your word. So I protect my way. I guard it according to your word, in line with what your word says. So the basic answer is, I think what he's saying is, I devote attention and energy to guarding my life according to your word. And in the next verses, he's going to get really practical here and and tell us of some of what this guarding work entails. But again, it's important to go back to the idea of just as desire has to translate into commitment, commitment without any sort of plan to move forward often doesn't go very far. Right? You ever try one of those, you know, January 1st, I'm going to change this, right? Um, Yeah, sometimes it works, right? But, But usually there's a plan, that's what's going to help. And so he has a plan here of what's going to happen. Otherwise, we end up with broken resolutions, unmet longings, and, uh, and we don't want to end up there. And so here's what he says. I have six ways here that he gives us. Um, and it's important. This is going to take some work in our lives, but it's important to realize many Christians lack joy and fruitfulness and assurance of salvation because they won't commit to these things. 
They won't pursue God's word in keeping it. And, and I, there are other reasons we lack joy in the Christian life. I understand that. This, the world is broken. There are a lot of things, right? Um, so I'm not saying if you're in a, in a time of despair that that obviously means you're not going to God in his word. Um, but even in those moments, it's God's word where I wanna, is where I want to go. He, remember I said that earlier in, ver, in verse 50. In the middle of my affliction, your promises. That's my hope. Okay? Okay, so six ways to begin or keep walking in God's ways. The first is in verse 10. And I, I summarize it as, ask God to keep you fixed, your heart fixed, on seeking him. With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. So again, the inner person, with everything that I have, my, my mind, my desires, my loves, my hates, my will, um, I want to orient all that after seeking you. Um, so there's no room for selective hearing here. You guys know how that works, right? Like as a kid, you could, um, you could hear when mom and dad were talking about the presents they were going to give you for Christmas or something, and then, um, but when they told you to do the dishes, like, you just all of a sudden were deaf. It was like they were talking another language or something. Um, no, with my whole heart, I seek you. But here's the part, here's what he's doing. He's asking God right here, um, keep me from wandering. And I think that's really what I'm saying here is, is the first thing is going to God and saying, God, keep me from wandering. I am prone to wander. Keep me from wandering. And, it, and it's important to note here that the opposite of seeking God is not always just a premeditated, um, God, I'm not going to do it. It's often a wandering, a, a slow departure from God's ways that will lead us away from keeping his word. Other things start to become equally as important to us as God, even good things that somehow make the way up there kind of on equal footing with God over our lives, whether it's relationships or money or comfort. On and on the list could go. So we need to cry out daily, let me not wander from your commandments. The second point is memorize scripture. We see this in verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So I've treasured it up. I've piled it up like treasure, I think is what those first words are saying. Um, I'm putting it in this bank account that I can write checks from. I'm taking your word, I'm putting it, I'm making the deposit into the bank account of my mind and of my heart, and I'm able to write checks from that later. You, I mean, you do realize that, like, you, you can't write checks to fight temptation if you haven't put the deposits of God's word in there to draw on. I mean, they're going to bounce. That's the way it works, right? That's, I mean, it's economics. So it's the same thing here. It's, it's this, I've stored up your treasure. Your word has been treasured in my heart. So, you know, when I face temptation or trials or difficulties or unbelief, I can, I can use these words from you, God. So memorize it. The, and the purpose, again, is that I might not sin against you. It's not just so I can show off at Bible Bowl right? I go to some, it's like the Super Bowl for Bible nerds or something, and we just pull out verses and see who knows more. Now, this is that I might not sin against you. That's the goal of God's word, and knowing it and memorizing it. So, practical application, make a plan to memorize God's word, um, even if it's only one verse a month. If you're doing none right now, well, at least you'll have 12 done by the end of the year, right? Um, and, and in my own life, as I'm going through this, I'm recognizing this has been something in my own life that has not been a, as much of a regular practice recently as it should be. So I want to get recommitted to memorizing God's word. Thankfully, I, I memorized a lot younger, and I can draw on those, but I don't want to get stagnant in this. I love God, and I want to know his word. There are apps that can help you with this nowadays. You could, so um, I think um, Fighter Verses or something by uh, Desiring God. There's all sorts of apps that can help you stay on top of this, you could just take a note card and write down the verse you're going to memorize and take it with you. Look at it, breakfast, lunch, dinner, right before bed. Um, there are all sorts of practical ways you can go about this, but the point is there's a storing up of God's word in the heart so that I have it to draw upon um, daily. Um, and this, internalizing God's word really is the best weapon we have to fight against sin. It is. Um, and to make ourselves happy. Right? I mean, I, I want to know what you say, God. That makes me happy. Third, have a teachable and attentive attitude. See this in verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. You want, you want to learn God's will? What's God's will for my life? You want to hear from God? 
let me tell you, the Spirit of God speaks through the Word of God. You get into a lot of dangerous stuff if you start going out there and saying, I want to hear from the Spirit of God, and I'm not going to the Word of God. If you try to separate the Spirit from the Word that He inspired, you end up in mysticism. No, understanding God's will, His Word, His ways is saying, teach me God, and He taught us through His Spirit-inspired Word, here, written on pages to read. So I hear by reading. I actually hear with my eyes in this sense. So teach me, God. And and this is a teach me, this is the humble attitude. This is really where I'm going with this section is this is a humble attitude. I want to hear from you. I want to be taught by you. You could memorize scripture all day long and it's not going to matter if you don't want to learn from God. If your attitude is one one of, well, God, present what you want to say and uh, I'll evaluate it and I will make a decision and I'll let you know whether I've decided to keep that part of your word or not. That's, That's not what this is. This is a humble, God, you are the teacher. I want to learn from you. Because God's a teacher who's always right. Right? I mean, it's okay to at times question your human teachers right, and ask questions, and, uh, but no, God is always right when he speaks. That doesn't mean we don't wrestle with difficult things in there. We can, and we do. But at the end of the day, when I see it clearly in God's word, right, I have studied it, I've come to see it and understand it, and it is clearly in God's word, you taught me your ways, God. You know, I have a teachable attitude. I want to do what you say. Fourth, um, speaking God's truth with my lips, I declare all your rules of your mouth. Um, this, so he's, it's out loud talking about it. It could be saying it to himself as part of memorizing it. Um, and by the way, um, if you listen to yourself talk a lot, you probably would do better to talk to yourself with God's truth instead. I mean, your mind gets going in circles, right? Um, don't pretend like it doesn't happen to you, right? It goes in circles and speak to yourself instead of just letting your mind go around. Um, it could also be sharing it with others, Right? I have, I've, I've opened the treasure chest of God's word. I've found amazing things, and I want to speak of it to other people. And by the way, that's a good way to learn God's word, is to talk about it, what you're learning to other people. It makes it stick. Fifth, value God's word. He makes a value comparison in verse 14. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. Wealthy people delight in riches. Why? Because it's valuable, Right? And so he's saying, God, your testimonies are as valuable as all the riches I could ever imagine. That's how valuable your word is to me. Rightly valuing God's word is the key to delighting in it and going to it. Well, sixth, meditate on God's word. See this in verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. So meditate, you may, I mean, it's not a word we necessarily use every day. Here it's parallel in, in the English Standard Version to fix my eyes. Um, so I think he's talking, it's kind of the idea of meditating is like fixing your mind's eye, your brain. Fixing your brain on God's truth. That's what meditation is. In, in a focused, intentional, thoughtful, mentally chewing on and digesting type of way. That's what I'm doing when I meditate on God's word. It's not just um, skimming the surface of it. It's really getting into understanding what it means and what it means for my life and the life of those around me. Um, Spurgeon talks about it kind of being like this idea, um, not necessarily meditation. He's talking about God's word, but he says something about um, it needs to be like we're, we're like a silkworm or you might think of like a caterpillar. They don't, just, they don't just go over the surface of the leaf, right? They stop and they start chewing on that thing. They are putting it in them and they are really, they're, they're turning it over right? So that's what he's saying. You don't just skim over the surface of this stuff. You need to mentally chew on this. This is God's word. This requires slowing down. It requires taking undistracted time to think about it. These are disciplines. This is duty, and there are disciplines associated with it. This doesn't necessarily happen naturally for many of us. So, so we need to make time and effort and energy for this. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a blessing to this, too. So, for example, you, know, you could read um, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. You could just read that, and that's fine. It, it, it is right to read God's word. You ought to spend time reading God's word. But to meditate it would be, okay, do nothing. What does that mean? Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. Well, it means that in everything I do, it shouldn't be characterized by rivalry and conceit, right? Rivalry, what is that? Well, that's me, that's me like fighting and vying with someone else for something. Where, where, where am I tempted to do that? Right? I use this example at, at, at weddings because it's, it was, this is a passage that really spoke to me a lot. Um, you know, when the, one of the kids wakes up in the middle of the night crying, 
man, there was rivalry in my heart at times, right? There was this, like, I'm fighting for more sleep, so I'm going to pretend like I'm not hearing what's going on. Um, now, we all have different roles and responsibilities, and I get that, but at the same time, right, the problem is if I have a rivalrous heart, that's a problem. And by meditating, I'm able to start thinking, okay, so where am I engaging in rivalry in my life, right? Consider the interest of others above your own. Well, okay, well, what does that mean? And then, okay, well, it means thinking about their needs and what God says is most important for them, the interest, what's best for them ultimately according to God. And so, okay, so who in my life, where, who are the people in my life that, God, that God's brought across my path? Okay, what are their interests? You see what I'm saying? You start meditating on it, it's very applicational, but it's also very like, I want to know what this says so that I can really chew on it and see it affect my life. And so that's what we want to do. So maybe, maybe the verse you're memorizing, maybe you pick a verse that deals with an issue that you know you want to grow in or a promise that you know you need to hear. And so not only are you memorizing it, but you're, you're chewing on it mentally. You're taking time on maybe the back of that note card to write out things as you read it and things you see in it and applications you can make from it. And then you're saying, God, help me to keep your way. Help me to do this. This isn't work. This is work. It's not easy. I get that, okay? So I'm not saying I've arrived. Like, I just, I'm just, you know, I do this all the time, and this is, uh, there are ups and downs in this for me, too, just probably like you. But man, you know, God, help us to do this. In verse 16, he comes to this um, renewed resolve after talking about how he's going to do it, so he's really made a plan here, he comes back and is, I commit, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So having treasured up God's word in his heart and talking about how he's going to do it, he has a renewed zeal, I will do this. And so that's the question, is that your renewed zeal? Is that your desire? I will do this. I will treasure your word in my heart. I will delight in your word. Walking in God's word requires faithful, regular discipline in life. It takes work. And we have a duty. God's told us to do it. Um, so again, I'm not saying this is easy. Maybe you start small. Maybe you start with one verse a month that you're memorizing. Please don't let that be the only thing you're reading. Read more of God's word. But for memorizing and meditating, right? Again, so often I think we find ourselves unfruitful, unhappy, um, sinning regularly in the same way because we don't do this. We, we don't either, we don't believe that God's word and walking in his ways really is a blessing, and then therefore we're not, we're not really walking in it. We're not putting forth the effort to do it. And again, I, I realize there are times where, where we face deep difficulty that brings about some sort of unhappiness where we feel like God is frowning on us. I mean, we, we see that in Job and other places, but even there, there's still a, we even saw this morning, uh, Job 23, 26, I don't remember what chapter it is, but basically he says, in the middle of all this, God, I don't know what's going on, this is difficult, I am really sad right now, but I want to keep your word. Help me keep your word. Because he knew that, he needed to hear from God, that was where his joy was going to be found. So it's work, it takes work, but it's not drudgery, it's delight. God's word is truly a delight. Um, Think about in, in church history, again, how many people who went to jail suffered all sorts of things and yet had this joy that you look at when you read their biographies and you just envy them. I, I guarantee you, the, those folks were people like John Bunyan who bled Bible. So we need to bleed Bible, right, if we're going to have this same happiness and joy in life. I think in my own life, um, how I just hearing God's word um, having, um, sitting under the preaching of the word here, having pastors and other people who instructed me and helped me memorize and meditate on God's word had so affected my path for life, even at a young age, even in high school. I'm not pretending like I did any, uh, this perfectly, right? And anything that worked out well is God's grace, so all the glory goes to him. But my point is, I can agree with the psalmist and say, blessed are those whose way is blameless, right? Who walk in your way. And again, you might, you might look at me and think, well, yeah, it's easy for you to say. Life's easy for you right now. It's hard for me. Again, look at Job. Look at, look at jo John Bunyan, right? Look at Jesus. Look, look at the psalmist in Psalm 119. He even talks about, um, blessed are you, God, you, you afflicted me that I might really know you through your word. Through that affliction, you drove me deeper into your word, into meditating on it. So brothers and sisters, may we fulfill our happy duty of keeping God's word. Let me pray for us. Father, oh, that we might be steadfast in keeping your ways. 
that we may walk in your ways, that we may know the happiness that is a gracious gift to us from you through your word and through the empowering spirit that you've given us to keep your word. God, we want to keep your word. It has pleased you to speak to us, and so we receive it joyfully. And we ask, God, would you help us to keep your word? In Jesus' name, amen.